Good morning, church. It's good to see these pews filling up. We have a special day today, and I know a lot of you are, are here particularly for that special moment. You have to stay tuned for that, because that comes later on in the day this afternoon when we um, have the ordination of, of Pastor Daniel. But a couple of few little uh, housekeepings um, just for our local members um, before we kick off this morning. If you've read your bulletin already today, you will see there is a business meeting on Monday. Uh, that's already had to be postponed to the 28th of March. So please don't come this coming Monday. Um, that has been postponed to the 28th of March. Uh, unfortunately, Daniel and family do need to head off uh, for a funeral um, and they'll be gone for a couple of weeks. So if you have any dramas, contact one of the elders and um, we'll, we'll see how that goes. Um, after the service today, there is a potluck lunch in the, in the hall, just like last week. We haven't done one for so long and now we've got two in a row. And if you came last week, I imagine you were well fed and hopefully we can do the same uh, today. So after the service, uh, just down the hall, just down this way, uh, there'll be a lunch for all. And um, for any of those um, special people who spent so much time in the kitchen last week and you haven't been thanked yet, we, we thank you sincerely and um, hopefully we can all help you out today. Um, yes, so 2.30 is the ordination program, so I encourage you all to please uh, stick around for that after you've been well fed. Stick around for 2.30 ordination start. Um, where Pastor Daniel, our, our local church pastor, will, will be ordained officially. Um, so we look forward to that. So welcome, welcome to our, our locals, welcome to our guests, our, our regular guests, Re welcome to those who, who have travelled a fair way. And we'll do some more um, formal um, welcomes later on this afternoon. But, but this morning I just want to mention our uh, Pastor Kristen Kopchenu, was it close? No, it wasn't. I could tell. I've been practicing and it wasn't. But we welcome, welcome you, Kristen. Um, I'm sure even if you don't recognise his face, you're going to recognise his voice once he starts speaking from, from Faith FM. Um, and Kristen is now um, president of South New South Wales Conference. So he's come a fair way today. So we, so we thank you for that. Um, I also had... Uh, a thank you for Michael in our piano, and now I'm thanking Marcy. So it's, we are blessed. We are blessed. We, we sometimes struggle with a pianist, and now we have two very good ones today. And, and I hear there's a couple more lurking as well. But, but thank you so much. Thank you so much. So, um, yeah, good to see you all. Um, hopefully we're going to have a, a special day by, by the end of it, but um, we look forward to... The message this morning, what Kristen will, will share with us, and um, I now just like to invite our singers up, and we'll have our song service. So thank you. Happy Sabbath Church, and uh, you all look colourful and beautiful, that's good, God bless you very much. Our first hymn for the day will be What a Wonderful Saviour, hymn 335, at the turn of the music, I will ask you to rise and join us in singing. Christ has atonement made what a wonderful Savior. Deemed the prices paid what a wonderful Savior. 
What a wonderful Savior is Jesus, my Jesus. What a wonderful Savior is Jesus, my Lord. Praise Him for His cleansing blood. What a wonderful Savior. Consult my soul to God, what a wonderful Savior, what a wonderful Savior is Jesus, my Jesus, what a wonderful Savior is Jesus, my Lord. Beside me all the way, what a Wonderful Savior keeps me faithful day by day. What a wonderful Savior! What a wonderful Savior is Jesus, my Jesus. What a wonderful Savior is Jesus, my Lord.
You know, when Pastor Daniel and, and family came to Bendigo, when they, when they were sent here by Pastor Christian, we must, we must thank him as well, because as a bonus, we received Daniel's parents as well, Stephen, who just prayed, and, and Kayleen as well. So that whole family has been a blessing to Bendigo, so thank you. It's now time for our offering, and today is a local church budget, so I'd encourage those uh, deacons to please come forth. Let's pray. Our Lord, Father, we thank you once again for the ability to give our tithes and offerings to you. Thank you for the faithfulness of those willing to give, Lord. And we pray that this money will be put to good use in your loving name. Amen. Good morning. Do we have any children here this morning? Any? I can see a few. Would you like to join me up the front for a story? Thank you. I'll sit here. You come sit here next to me. Any your children? Almost as many children as the adults, or maybe a few more. Good to see you all. Now, I haven't been to Bendigo too many times. Does it get really cold in Bendigo? No? Anyone here from Bendigo? A few? Yeah? Does it get really cold? It gets cold in winter. What do you have to do when it's really cold? What do you do when it's really cold outside? Yeah? Um, we usually just have sleep-ins. Sleep-ins. I love sleep-ins. Yeah, the fireplace, we'll yeah. Heat the heaters. The heaters, yeah. What if you have to go outside? What do you do if you have to go outside? Warm clothes, yeah. Keep a dressing gown on. Beanies, anyone have a beanie? Yeah, yeah. Does it get really hot in Bendigo in summer? Yeah, sometimes. What do you like to do when it's really hot? You like to dip in your blow-up pool. Of course, going to the pool is so much fun. That's right. Now, when I was about five, anybody here five? Anybody close to five? Yeah, Heidi there, yeah. You're five? Okay, I was about five, so your age, or close to that, right? And I lived in a really small little country village about 20,000 kilometres away on the other side of the world. And it was really, really hot one day. I lived with my grandmother and my sister. There was just the three of us, and it was really, really hot. Thankfully, the little village was near a small lake. And middle of the day, it was really hot. I asked my grandmother, can we please go to the lake? And she said, sure, let's go. So my grandmother, my sister, and I went to the lake, and there was a little beach, and you know the water was nice and cool, and I was splashing. Now, how many of you know how to swim? Yeah, you're learning? And you're five? And you're learning. That's really good. Maybe a little bit old, day. I'm learning. I'm learning. I'm learning. I'm learning. You're learning. He'll come back to you when you get in the water. Now, I didn't know how to swim back then because they didn't have lessons in the little village that I lived in. 
And while my grandma there was there, I was splashing just up to my ankles and playing in the sand. Do you like to build castles in the sand and trenches and you dig a hole? Yeah, you remember that? The ocean is even better than the lake, absolutely. Now, my sister wasn't that keen about the water, so she didn't get wet, and she said to my grandmother, can we go on the other side of this little hill and collect some flowers? There was a field full of wild flowers, and grandma said, sure, I'll come with you. And she looked at me, and she said, Christian, don't, what do you think she said? Don't go in the water. Don't go in the water. Just wait for a few minutes, play with your sand and your castles and your bucket and your spade, but don't go in the water. It is funny. What do you think I said? Sure, Grandma. And then Grandma went with my sister over the little hill and they started picking flowers. Now the hill was high enough so I couldn't see them and they couldn't see me. And there was no one else there. It was a tiny little village. Not many people lived there. And they were gone for about two minutes, three minutes, four minutes, five minutes. And it was really hot, remember? You're a very clever young man. I had that same bright idea. What if I got into the water up to my, just splashing with my ankles, right? My feet, my ankles. Do you think that's dangerous? Yeah. Yeah. Could you drown in water that deep? I was five. I mean, you're a big boy at five. Possible, but I wasn't thinking about that. Yes? What if I went a little bit deeper, up to my knees? What do you think about that? Is that a bad idea? No, you can't. Let's agree. We'll agree. Yeah, you're not a toddler. Not a bad idea. I'm not a toddler. Well, no quicksand, thankfully. And no tide, so I was safe. Now, yeah, you lost a tooth as well. Now, I was having so much fun, and I thought, what if I go up to my... You know how this story goes, up to my waist, and it felt so nice and cool and good. It was fantastic. And then I thought, what if I go up to my up to my chest? Now, what I didn't know, because the water was fairly muddy, it wasn't clear, I couldn't see. As I went up to my chest, the river bank or the lake bank was quite gradual, but all of a sudden, there was a big drop. That's my chest, yeah. There was a big, big drop. And I put one foot forward, and all of a sudden, everything was dark, and I'm drinking a lot more water than I really needed. And I start to try talk, and how does it sound? Have you ever tried talking underwater? I'm drinking water, I'm blowing bubbles, it's dark, I have no idea what's going on. Yes. Yeah, you get water going in everywhere. And I was going deeper and deeper and deeper. There was nobody there at the lake. My sister and grandmother were on the other side. They couldn't see. And I had another brainwave. I thought, I am in trouble. Mm. And I was taught by my parents and my grandmother, when you're in trouble, the yeah, I tried to do that under the water. Mm. But they taught me something else. They said, when you're in trouble, the first thing you should always do is... And in my... In the depths of the water, with my bubble noises, it didn't sound like any language you'd ever heard of, but in my mind, I was praying, Jesus, help me. And that very moment, I felt these two big hands pick me from under my arms. It was your grandma, it was you. And the next thing I know, I am literally sitting on the lake shore. I'm not in the water, I'm not drinking anymore, and I can breathe again, and I can see the sun. And I look around. Nobody to my left, nobody to my right. I look behind, and the little hill is behind me. And just as I look behind, I can see my sister and grandmother coming over the little hill. They're just coming. They're still about 30, 40 meters away, a bit of a distance. Well, I wasn't. And my grandmother comes and says, you okay, Christian? Because I probably looked a little bit startled. She said, you okay? And I'm like, I'm fine. 
There was nobody else there. Who do you think he might have been? An angel. I am sure it was an angel. You know, there's two things I learned from that story. One, you should always listen to your mum, to your dad, to your grandparents, to your teachers, because when they tell you to do things, they usually have a good idea how to keep you safe. But the second thing that I've never forgotten is that when we're in trouble, and even when we're not, but especially when we're in trouble, we can pray to God. And Jesus will answer. He loves us. He cares for us. He'll be with us. So the first thing we can do when we're in trouble is ask Jesus for help. You remember that? Next time, listen to the adults that love you. And when you're in trouble, do pray. Well, thank you for listening, boys and girls, and engaging so well. Right, so as I was looking at this hymn uh, throughout the week, I was thinking, if I had won uh, the lotto, I'd, I'd be pretty happy about that. I might not proclaim it in words, but you'd see the car, the house, and the other gifts I'd buy for my friends and family. I'd, I'd definitely be proclaiming it. And I thought, what have we? We haven't won it, but we've been given it, this eternal life which is worth much more than the most money you could think of in the world. Because money cannot buy life, it cannot buy years. But Christ says, I, I have given you eternal life. How much more do we need to proclaim this salvation? I hope you, you will sing with a conviction in your heart. You're, you're, we are redeemed not because we feel it. You don't need to feel redeemed because he said so, and we believe it. That's all we need. At the turn of the music, I'll ask you to stand.
one of the joys and privileges of ministry is that you get to move to many different places, which your wife and children absolutely love. Some years ago, we had the privilege to move to a new town, new city, and uh, after we'd unpacked things for a few days, it was Friday evening, we started investigating what church we could go to. It was the largest city, plenty of churches to choose from within half an hour of where we lived. We Googled it and decided to start from those closest to us to those furthest away. And we found a church that was nearby, found the address, found the opening time, went to that church on Sabbath. New town, new place, didn't know anybody there. Do you remember what it was like, or do you remember the last time you went to a new church? Remember the experience? Yeah, yeah. Is it bringing warm and fuzzies, or a little bit of tension? What was it like for you? We went through the foyer at the back, and someone greeted us at the door. Welcome, here's a record. You have to have a record at the door, right? The records are a fail-safe in case the sermon is too boring, right? Got the record, took the girls to Sabbath school, and I came back through the back door. And when you're visiting a new church for the first time, where do you normally like to sit? You love walking through the middle aisle right to the front so everybody can see you, right? How many of you do that? Yeah, a few brave souls here. Yes, yes. Well, I wasn't that brave. You sit at the back because it's safe. You can watch. You can see what's going on. You can tell who the normal people are, right? Right? So I sat at the back, and thankfully they had these, you know, demountable chairs that you can move rather than the pews. I sat at the back and went through preliminaries. Do you remember that? Anyone know what preliminaries are? Yeah. It means a lot to a visitor. Welcome to the preliminaries, right? So I sit down, they finish preliminaries, and then the person at the front that's conducting the preliminaries says, now it's time for Sabbath school. We have lots of groups. Pick any that you want. Have you ever heard them say that at church? Pick any Sabbath school group that you want? Yeah. What's the problem with that statement? Here's my problem. I don't know if any of you have ever experienced this. I always pick the wrong group. Any of you pick the wrong group? I go to the group where they spend half an hour reading the lesson word for word, and the group across the road there, they're having a fantastic time. They're laughing and they're chatting, and it looks like it's great, but I always pick the wrong group. But then the person up the front said something else. She said, or you can follow a church member, and they will introduce you to their group, which is fantastic because you're a visitor, and you know who all the members are, right? Which church member would you follow? How do you decide which member to follow? Male, female, young, old, how they dress? How do you, well, anyway, I thought, I've done this before. This time I'm going to pick the right church member. So I had a look. There was this lady, probably mid-40s, early 50s. She was dressed smart, looked presentable, had a smile on her face. And I thought, I'm going to follow her because I'm sure whatever Sabbath school class she goes to will be okay. So I start following her until she goes through a door, and on the door it said, ladies. I thought, you just got to be careful who you follow at church, right? So I go back into church, and I go back to my chair. Remember, I'm at the back pew, right there at the back, and you've got these demountable chairs, these chairs that you can move. It's not a pew. And I'm just sitting there watching as the groups are dispersing. And I thought, I followed the wrong person once, I'm just going to watch, see where the groups go, and try to get a vibe for how people are moving, you know. If they're moving like this to their group, you know, they're already, you know, on their way to their execution. I don't want to follow that person. So you're just sitting there, you're watching, you're observing, and then to my left, let me do it this way so we can still see it on camera. To my left, there's a gentleman coming. He was probably, again, mid-40s, in a suit, tie, dressed well, looked like a football player, big, broad shoulders, muscly, And he comes straight towards me. He's got a little bit of a smile on his face. And I'm thinking, this is good. Maybe I don't have to follow someone. Maybe he'll take me by the hand and introduce me to his class or group. And I look at him, and I'm I'm just looking because there's nobody nearby. He comes right next to me, and I'm using the chair to illustrate so you get a sense of what was happening. He comes close to me, 
and I'm sitting there, and he looks at me and smiles, and he takes my chair. And then he puts the chair behind me. So I'm here, my chair was here, he took my chair, put it behind me, where a number of other people had also put chairs in a circle. And he proceeds to sit down, and I'm looking, and he turns around to the people that have formed a circle behind me, and he says, welcome to our Sabbath school class. How was your week? Anyone had anything similar happen to them like that? Now, it is really easy to judge. It is really easy to say, well, that was just that particular person. But, you know, as I spent more time at that church, I discovered that that man was on a mission and he had really good intentions. What were his intentions? Now, it's okay if you speak up when I'm asking a question. They're not so rhetorical. What do you think his intentions were? He was trying to run a good Sabbath school because that was his job, and he was doing a fantastic job. I ended up joining the class. He did a great job. Sometimes in doing a great job for the Lord, sometimes in being so excited about doing the things that we're called to do, sometimes in wanting to make sure that we set up a good chair in a good group so everybody's engaged and participating, we might miss the things that matter most. And the question we're going to spend some time exploring this morning is what exactly is church? Is it running a good Sabbath school class? Is it a good sermon? I'm working with a church plant at the moment, and this church plant started about a year ago, and their desire was to reach the community. Their desire was to be a seven-day Adventist church. But a year in, and as I go to their leadership meetings, do you know the one thing that consumes most of their time? How do we run a good program from 9.30 to 12.30? And their only definition of church is what happens between 9.30 and 12.30. Is that what church is? What is church? What are our churches? What is your church like? You know, we can be a little bit biased about our own churches, can't we? especially if we've been here long enough, we feel our church is doing better than the average church and we're pretty comfortable with what we would see our church being. But a better question to ask about what is church and what our church is like is to question someone looking in through the window or through the door that hasn't generally been with us before. How would an outsider describe our church and I'm going to pick on Bendigo because we're at Bendigo. I know some of you are visiting from different places, but let's pick on Bendigo and you can use that as your own example. Someone looking into Bendigo Church from the outside, how would they describe it? Now, we would use words like friendly, loving, caring, but they're things that we feel being inside. Someone looking through the window, if someone came and spent seven days looking through the window at our church, or visiting as we go about our homes, how would they describe our church? Now, I don't know Bendigo, and Daniel hasn't given me any you know, particular insights into what you do, but I'm going to use an example of a typical Adventist church, or sometimes even a Christian church, for a seven-day period. What would they see? How would they describe it if they were running an investigative article about Bendigo Adventist church? What would they say? Okay. And we feel that because we're inside. If they were looking through the window, what would they say? What would they see us do? They'd see some things that are different. They'd, well, they'd say, well, you know, maybe for convenience they meet on Saturdays. Because Sunday, I don't know what they do on Sunday. You can sleep in on Sunday. What do they do? Well, once a week they turn up at about 9.30, sort of 9.30, 9.30-ish, 10-ish, 10.30-ish, right? because we sort of have this staggered approach, all right? We, we come in gradually. And then they get together and they talk. They open the Bible and they talk for about 45 minutes. Some talk here, some talk in the rooms where they have something for kids. And then everybody comes back. And what do they do then? Well, they sing a few songs. And what happens? They might have a children's story. And what's next? And then someone gets up and talks for half an hour, 40 minutes, 50 minutes, 60 minutes. Depends who is preaching. 
I, I love the fact that that clock is so far away, I can't see the time. So, no, it's okay, leave it there. No time this morning. <laughs> um, yeah. I'm looking at you. I'm focused on you. So someone preaches for half an hour to 60 minutes, and then what do they do? Every now and again, they eat together, and then they go home, and then what? Sometimes they have prayer meeting, where a whopping seven people turn up on a good evening. Sometimes it's three. And then what else do they do? What is church? What else would they write about us? How would they describe who we are, what we do, what they experience if they were to be part of us or to join us? Well, when I look at the description, most of what we do and who we are happens when? 9.30-ish to 12.30-ish, depending on who's preaching. Which is why, when we talk about church, what are we usually referring to? 9.30 to 12.30. Because that's all everybody else sees. That's all we experience. That's the bulk of who we are and what we do. Which is why this program on Saturday morning has become so central to who we are as a people. But is that what church is? That is why, when I'm tasked with running Sabbath school... I'm so focused on running a good Sabbath school that I might ignore the person sitting here because I've got to run a good Sabbath school. Because at the end of the day, when someone says, what is your church like, what are we evaluated based on? We don't evaluate it based on what happened on Tuesday, do we? What are we evaluated on? Based on what happens between 9.30 to 12.30. Church is great when we have some good facilitators. Thank you, Darren, for this morning. Fantastic facilitator. Church is great when we have good facilitators for Sabbath school. Church is great when the pastor is a dynamic, vibrant, energetic, exciting, enthusiastic speaker who can do all of that in 25 minutes. Right? We evaluate church based on, at most, three hours of the week. And we are so focused on doing that so well that it is extremely easy to ignore or to miss, or to overlook the people and the things that may matter just as much, if not more. Are you with me so far? So what is church? We're going to spend all of our time this morning in Acts chapter 2. So open your Bibles to Acts chapter 2. We're not going to read the whole chapter, just 43 verses. Acts chapter 2. We'll start from the beginning. We're going to read a few verses Now, I am making an assumption that many of you are familiar with this. If you're not familiar with it, borrow, take a Bible from church, look it up online, and read the entire chapter in the book of Acts, for that matter, um, after church in your own time. We're only going to read some of it. Acts chapter 2, we're reading from verse 1. On the day of Pentecost, all the believers were meeting together in one place. Suddenly there was a sound from heaven like the roaring of a mighty windstorm, and it filled the house where they were sitting. Then what looked like flames or tongues of fire appeared and settled on each of them. And everyone present was filled with the Holy Spirit and began speaking in other languages as the Holy Spirit gave them this ability. The disciples are together. It doesn't exactly say what day of the week they're on. And it doesn't tell us they're in a church program, does it? It doesn't say they were at their regular worship service. Now, some commentators will suggest that it was a Sabbath day, and it may very well have been a Sabbath day, but we don't know that. It doesn't say that. It just says it was a day of Pentecost, and I think that fell on Sabbath often, if not all the time. They are together. The Holy Spirit comes upon them. They start speaking in other languages. They're sharing the gospel news, and as they're doing that, people in Jerusalem, because they're not just sitting in that room, As you read from verse 5, at that time, there were devout Jews from every nation living in Jerusalem. When they heard the loud noise, everyone came running, and they were bewildered to hear their own language being spoken by the believers. They're completely amazed. The gospel is being preached, presented, shared in different languages. What we do as a church is we read through the book of Acts, and we look at the things they did, and we try to imitate what they did in order to be like them. They preached, therefore we should preach. They met in homes, therefore we should 
meet in homes. They did small groups, therefore we should do small groups. One of the things we don't spend a lot of time reflecting on, though, is why were they doing those things? So we're going to go and ask a few why questions preceding what happens here in the book of Acts in chapter 2. In verse 1, it says, On the day of Pentecost, all the believers were meeting together in one place. Why? Why were they meeting together? What was the reason that these believers were together? And if you have a little bit of a look at the believers or the kind of people that are in that room, we get a very interesting mix of people. We have a few tradesmen. Who were the tradesmen? You got your Peters, who was a fisherman, right? You've got a few tradey business owners, people who come from a slightly more affluent background. You've got John and James, and their father owned boats and had hired help. That's quite something. When most people just live to get by day to day, John came from a more affluent family. The tradition says that he was even connected to the high priest's family. We know that when he followed Jesus at his trial, he was known to the high priest. Who else do we have? We have a parking ticket inspector. Anybody here a parking ticket inspector? I hope not. Forgive me if you are. You do a fantastic job. You help keep the economy afloat. But tax collectors were about as atrocious, as violent, as hated as parking ticket inspectors, and then add some on top of that. So you've got a tax collector who is a traitor to the cause. Who else do you have? You've got someone who's just come across from Afghanistan after spending some time with ISIS and the Taliban. You've got Simon the Zealot. And to all extents and purposes, he was likely a Sakari, a dagger man, a terrorist. Now, I know there was some religious nuances as well, but it calls him a zealot. It's not exactly a compliment. Can you imagine coming to church? Hey, Darren the terrorist, welcome. Right? You don't talk like that. You've got a skeptic who doesn't believe anyone and everything. Good morning, it's not a good morning. Was it a bad morning? It's not a bad morning. What morning is it? Who knows what morning it is? Doubting Thomas, right? Doesn't believe a word anybody says. What else do you have in the mix? Well, thankfully, up until this point, they had someone with common sense who carried the money bag, but he went off and finished himself. You've got this odd, eclectic bunch of people that on top of all these disparate and disconnected and dysfunctional men, there's also a huge group of women. And we all know what women could offer in that society. Not very much. But they're all together. Why are they together? What's bringing them together? Before we look at why they meet, we need to really understand what got them together. And what got them together? Why were they all there? Because every single one of them, before they decided to meet together in one room, I mean, speaking of meeting together, how well did they get along? Were they really good friends? Did they love each other? Well, just a few days, well, no, it's 50 days now, just over seven weeks ago, they're having dinner together, and how are they behaving at dinner? So what's happening at dinner? When was the last time you fought over church lunch? Children and women first. I oh, know children and women sit down. I've got to get this one. You go to get the casserole and you just bring the casserole to your table because that's a good casserole. You made it, and if you don't go in first, you're not going to get any of that casserole. They're arguing over what's happening at dinner, and they're arguing as to who's sitting next to who. And the argument gets so bad that one of, well, two of the disciples have to get their mother involved. When was the last time you brought your mum to a church board meeting when you weren't getting your way? Anyone? They say, John and James, they get their mother involved. Lord, next time you have dinner, let me tell you who should sit on either side. Because, you know, this stuff's important. This is who the disciples are. There is no reason, no logical reason for them to be together when Jesus is not in the room. And yet they're together. Why are they together? Because each of the disciples had gone through a personal encounter and experience with Jesus. They are not together because they think Peter is such a great bloke. Peter's the kind of guy who talks first, 
And I'll, some people say he talked first and thought later, but no, Peter just talked first. He never got to the thinking part, right? You know anyone like that? Why would anyone have, want to be in the same room as Peter? You don't want to be in the same room as Peter. And yet they are together because they've encountered Jesus, the binding agent. The experience that brings them together in this room is not because if we get together, something might happen. It's we're getting together because something has happened. What happened? What happened was that they'd experienced Jesus. For us to be a thriving, excited, passionate, moving people of God, it is not about trying to figure out what more we should be doing in terms of programs and activities and structures. All those things are important and valuable, but it's first and foremost, every single day, making sure that we've encountered and we've experienced the living Jesus. That's where it begins. And because they experienced Jesus, because finally, after three and a half years of not getting it, did they get it for three and a half years? They didn't. Three and a half years of not getting it, not getting it, not getting it. Jesus says, I'm going to die. Oh, that's nice. Okay, but, but, but Jesus, um, when, when are you going to conquer the Romans? Uh, Jerusalem, and they're going to crucify me. Oh, that's nice, Jesus. But, but um, let's talk about parliamentary positions. Who's going to be the foreign affairs secretary? They didn't get it. But after three and a half years, they see Jesus die, and even then they don't get it because they're saying, we thought it was he. We thought, we thought. But then they see the risen Savior, and then the penny drops. And they've encountered that Jesus is here to save them from sin, not from the Romans, because the Romans are not a threat. Putin is not a threat. The floods are not a threat to our eternal salvation. COVID is not a threat. Those things are not threats. But sin, selfishness, problems of the heart are a threat. And after three and a half years, after the death and the resurrection of Jesus, they get it, they encounter Jesus, and they have an aha moment. We call it the conversion experience. And because they're converted, they actually get the idea, they get the fact, they get the truth. That is echoed in a famous chorus. Some of you may still know it because you're like me, old enough. This world is not. How does the song go? This world is not my home. I'm just passing. They get it. And they are so excited that they don't have to be afraid of the Romans. They don't have to be afraid of disease, of illness, of, of financial. But they don't have to fear in this earth because they're just passing through. And the kingdom is not of this world, but it's an eternal kingdom. That when they finally get that, it's like my brother here just shared about winning the lotto. If you win the lotto, it's hard to hide. You're going to try, but it's hard. They are so excited about what's going on when something so good happens, and when something good happens to you, who do you go talk to first? Most of us don't go out into you know, the shopping mall and start saying, I won the lotto. I mean, that's dangerous. What we do is we go and talk to the people that we know, to people around us. And so because they meet Jesus, they form, they get together. Church happens because of an encounter with Jesus. Now, often when we think of church, this is what we think of. This is what the community thinks of us, and it's the building and the program. But that's definitely not what the disciples built because they encountered Jesus. The word church is not a Hebrew word. It's not a Greek word. It derives from an probably about four, five hundred year old German word, Kirche. Now, I hope I don't have any Germans here. I might have butchered that, and don't quote me on the etymology here. But Kirche, and what was Kirche back then? Well, Kirche simply meant the building for worship. And because that's all church was five, six, seven hundred years ago, it was Kirche, 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 Church, 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 which is why today we still see church as a building. But the disciples definitely didn't have a concept of stained glass windows and soft wooden pews. That's not what church was for them. When the New Testament uses the word church, it uses ecclesia, which isn't anything to do with a church building. Where did the word ecclesia come from? It comes from two words, ek and kalo. And where did that come from? 
People that lived in a small town or even in a rural village didn't have mobile phones. They didn't have phones for that matter. They didn't have any way of communicating with each other and sharing public announcements and good news except by doing that in person. And when you had something good to share, something important, something interesting, when you wanted to make a public service announcement, when you wanted people around you to rejoice with you in your experience, you would walk to the middle of town or in the villages and you would say, come on out. You would call people out of their homes and they would come out of their homes and go to the nearest market town square or the biggest open space and you would get together and you would talk and share and you were community and this was to call out. That's what it simply was, come on out. That's what ekthalo meant. So the ecclesia was those that were called out to share, to rejoice, to be together and enjoy something that was about to be shared. So what was church? It was to come out and to gather together. It didn't have to be during a program. It didn't have to be to a building. The disciples experienced Jesus, and they were so excited that they called each other up using smoke signals and little paper notes, and they got together in the upper room, and what did they do? They shared their experiences. They talked about Jesus. It was so good that you had to speak out loud and share with someone your experience. Do you remember when we were on the road to Emmaus? Do you remember how depressed and discouraged we were? Do you remember what we were saying? We thought it was him. How could we have possibly forgotten that he'd said he was going to be crucified? Do you remember, John, when we had a race to the tomb? Uh, well, let's not talk about the race, actually, because um, you won. But do you remember when we raced down to the tomb and we got there and there was no one there? And Mary says, and do you remember the angel that appeared to me? Man, can you imagine that he told us for three years he was going to be crucified and none of us heard it? Can you imagine? Can you imagine we've been wanting him to... And they just go on and on and they are excited. They have an experience with Jesus and out of that experience, they have an overflow of joy, of enthusiasm, of passion. And overflow spills over and it spills to each other. They talk, they share out of an overflow. And what happens as they continue into that overflow, they build community out of the individual experience of overflow. So let's just go back together. Because they experienced Jesus, and only because they experienced Jesus, because there was no other reason for them to get together except to criticize and accuse and attack and blame each other, because they experienced Jesus, they got together. And what happens next? Well, one of the things that we see that's interesting about the community, you find that at the end of Acts chapter 2, verse, well, at the end of Acts chapter 2, verse 42. It says, All the believers devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and to sharing in meals, including the Lord's Supper, and to prayer. And a deep sense of awe came over all, and the apostles performed many miraculous signs and wonders, and all the believers met together in one place and shared everything they had. They sold their property and possessions and shared the money with those in need. They worshipped together at the temple each day, met in homes for the Lord's Supper, and shared their meals with great joy and generosity. They meet Jesus out of the overflow of that experience. It leads them to get together. Out of the overflow of getting together, they discover that some have more and some have less. And what do they start to do for each other? Well, the one who has more, what do they do? Well, they either sell or start to give it to those who have less, and they build this incredible community that cares for each other. Why did they do that? Because they had an overflow. Our community is so wonderful. It is so good to be together. Why are they together? Because they met Jesus. Jesus overflows into community. Community overflows into service, into caring for each other. They don't get up one morning with somber, serious faces and say, we should be caring for Sister Jenny because, uh, well, it's our duty. It doesn't happen that way. It comes out of an overflow of not who's putting their hand up for help, but we're getting to know when it looks like you need some help and we want to care for you because this world is not our home and that's what we're here to do. And We've got enough for today. We want to make sure you have enough for today. There is an overflow happening. As they care for each other out of overflow, what happens? When you've got too much 
for yourself and you share it with those in your immediate need and you still have too much, too much joy, enthusiasm, passion, time and resources, it starts to overflow into the community. What do they start to do? Well, they actually start sharing this incredible good news with those around them. Why are they doing that? Because they have too much and it is too good to keep to yourself. They experience Jesus. They get together. They care for others. They share good news. And none of those things are forced. None of those things are distorted. None of those things are things that people are doing out of duty or because the church manual says so or because it's policy or because it's expected of us. Why are they doing all of those things? Well, ultimately, it's none of these things. It's the first one. It's because they experience Jesus. And when you truly, genuinely, miraculously, and I have to touch on that, experiencing Jesus is a miracle. It's not head knowledge. It's not just because you can read Greek and Hebrew. It's not just because we're convinced intellectually. It's a supernatural encounter. You can't you can't write this down using the scientific method. It is the Holy Spirit touching your heart and mind and saying, you need more than what you have. There is an emptiness that only God can fill, and there is salvation that only God can give. There is hope that only Jesus can bring. That's why Jesus said it's like the what? What did he compare it to? It's like the wind. Experiencing that miracle of Jesus in our lives, then flows over to these other things. If someone was to look at the early church, how would they describe the early church? What would they say about them, and how does that match to how they would describe us? Would it be similar or different? What do you think? Would they say... They did a 9.30 to 12.30 program, three hymns and a prayer. Is that what they'd say about them? They definitely wouldn't say that because they didn't do that back then. Nothing wrong with that. But that's something that we've learned and developed over time. What would they say about them? Well, we have an example in the book of Acts, and we know that their enemies said these things about them. How often are they together? Well, it actually says daily. But I'm sure some of them had jobs and some of them had family commitments, but basically as often as they could. And what do they do when they get together? Well, they spend a lot of time arguing about what sort of branded air conditioners to buy. It can be a Samsung or a Dakin. Now, Dakins are definitely better, but the Samsungs are cheaper. And who does a better warranty? Well, Panasonic does a better warranty, and that's, that's a hard call. Is that what they did? What do they get together doing? It says, when you looked on the outside, they got together as often as they could, and they ate together. Why is eating so important? Eating loosens your jawbone muscles, right? How many of you have tried eating without opening your mouth? You've got to, you've got to open them eventually, and you've got to move your mouth eventually. And once your mouth starts moving, it's ready for something that we don't do as often and as well. It's ready for what? To talk because you're already warmed up. And you know what happens when we talk? Something amazing happens when we talk. We start to get a sense of what's happening in people's minds, what's happening in their hearts, what's happening in their lives. And we actually get to know each other. And the concept of knowing each other is called having a relationship with someone. It is really difficult to have a relationship with someone that you don't communicate with. Are you with me? And so we say we are church family and we love each other, but we don't do what with each other? We've got three minutes before we get into the Sabbath school lesson. How was your week? And that's wonderful to do, but is that enough? In three minutes in Sabbath school, how well do you know each other? We don't. And then you can't talk during the sermon. You better not talk during the sermon. Yes, you young lady up back there, don't talk during the sermon because I'm preaching. So we can't get to know each other during the sermon. And during Sabbath school, we can't really get to know each other because every time you start to go off topic, a really well-trained Sabbath school facilitator does what? 
They bring you back on topic because we're not here to get to know each other. We're here to do the lesson. We're only up at Tuesday, and in 10 minutes we have to finish. Let's get through to Friday. Right? There's no time to have a relationship between 9.30 and 12.30, is there? So if we don't spend time outside of 9.30 to 12.30, when do we have a relationship with each other? We don't have time to have relationships because we're all busy. But what is one thing that all of us do? We eat. And so because we eat, you can talk and eat at the same time and forget what your parents told you. Don't talk with your mouth open. That's okay. I'll forgive you. It doesn't bother me. I've seen worse. I've had children. I've changed diapers, right? They got together as often as they could and they had meals. Why? Because that built relationships. Why did they want to build relationships? Because they experienced Jesus. When you experience Jesus, he changes your heart, he changes your life from it's all about me to it's about others. I'm okay. I'm saved. It's not about me anymore. I don't have to worry or stress about whether I'll be saved, about what people think of me, about what people say about me, because it doesn't, does it matter what people think of me anymore? It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if they think I'm overdressed or underdressed or underweight or overweight. It doesn't matter what they think of me because I've met Jesus. And what matters is what he thinks of me, right? And so because I'm not worried about me anymore because I've met Jesus, all of a sudden I start to worry about other people because of my encounter with Jesus. And as they were looking on, they see them eating together regularly. It actually says every day, right? And it sees them sharing Someone had more. Well, look at them. Look what they're doing. What are they doing? Why are they playing with money over dinner? Well, they're not playing with money over dinner. They're actually seeing who needs help and what they can do and what they can give, and and they're feeding each other and clothing each other. And what else are they doing? Well, it looks like all the Christians are looked after. Now it looks like after they eat and sometimes before they eat, they just get out in town and they mingle with people. They talk to people. Well, what are they saying to people? What are they saying to people? What are they saying as they're going out? And how often are they going out? As often as they can. Why? Because they've met Jesus and they have an overflow. This isn't protracted. This isn't the pastor getting up the front and saying, we should do more evangelism. Come on, let's get to it. After lunch, we're going to go door knocking. And after lunch, who's the only one outside the church with leaflets in his hand? The pastor and his wife, because she's got no choice. And everybody else is busy. Why? You don't have to do that. You don't have to flog a dead horse. Because they've met Jesus, and when you met Jesus, it's too good not to share. There is an overflow. The early church would have been described very differently to ours by those outside. They would not have described them the way that they would describe us. In fact, we're going to go to a description from the early church. This was a couple of centuries after the early church had already formed. And by the church, we're not meaning building, we're not meaning program. By the time the gathering of people with an overflow had gotten together, by the time this had happened, the plague of Cyprian comes along. Now, how many of you have ever heard of the word, let's see, it's it's probably fairly unique, and most of you are not familiar with it, but pandemic? Yeah? Why are you laughing? I think think he's heard that, right? You've heard it somewhere? Yeah? This was a pandemic. Pandemic. Listen to the description of the pandemic, 249 to 262. It was a 13-year pandemic. We've had about two years. It's bad enough as it is. They went on for about 13 years. Sufferers experienced bouts of diarrhea, continuous vomiting, fever, deafness, blindness, paralysis of their legs and feet, swollen throats, and blood filled their eyes while staining their mouths. Isn't that a lovely description? Now, COVID has affected and definitely hurt many people, but nothing like what this would have done. If you got it, you died. There was no such thing as tough immune systems or hospitals you could go to. It was deadly. Millions of people in a world that was much smaller than ours died during this 13-year period. How did the average citizens respond? At the first onset of the disease, they pushed the sufferers away and fled from their dearest, throwing them into the roads before they were dead and treating unburied corpses as dirt hoping thereby to avert the spread and contagion of the fatal disease. But do what they might, they found it difficult to escape. Can you imagine you're at home and your spouse starts to cough? And you look closely and red eyes. And what do you do? 
you put some sort of cloth over your face, and from a distance, you tell her that she's got to leave the house. And that's because she can still walk. Your parents, on the other hand, as soon as they get it, they're bedridden. So what do you do to your mum and dad? Mum and dad, I love you, but I've got to throw you. And you get one of the children or your spouse to lift up their litter, and you basically, what does it say they did to them? What does it say? I'm not making this stuff up. They threw them into the street. Why did they throw them into the street? That's survival of the fittest. No hard feelings. I love you, mum. I love you, dad. But if I don't do this, we all go. And if we all go, who's going to look after the cows? You had to do this. How do the Christians behave? Most of our brother Christians showed unbounded love and loyalty, never sparing themselves and thinking only of one another. Why are they doing this? They've encountered Jesus. They've experienced Jesus. They have overflow. They're not afraid. Heedless of the danger, they took charge of the sick, attending to their every need and ministering to them in Christ. And with them, the part of this life serenely happened. For they were infected by others with the disease, drawing on themselves the sickness of their neighbors and cheerfully accepting their pains. What do you think of that as a description of how the church behaves, of how the church treats each other? Now, to be fair, this was written by someone who may have had sympathy with the Christians, and you can get that because he says, most of our. So he's talking about us. But there was someone during that time, I think it was a nephew of Constantine, Julian the Apostate. He was an apostate because Constantine tries to introduce Christianity. Julian tries to reverse it. He wants to go back to the old Roman gods into the former days of glory. Julian tried to, as much as he could, stamp out, eradicate Christianity and the message of Christianity. Towards the end of his life, he realized that his attempts were a colossal failure. And he writes about, remember, this is an enemy of Christianity, looking in through the window and describing what he sees. Atheism, this is how they refer to Christians, Atheism has been specially advanced through the loving service rendered to strangers and through their care for the burial of the dead. It is a scandal that the godless Galileans care not only for their own poor, but for ours as well, while those who belong to us look in vain for help that we should render them. The enemy of Christianity, what does he have to say about Christianity? He says it's scandalous. What's the scandal? It's scandalous that Christians not only care for themselves, but they also care for the pagans. They care for the outsiders. Here is an enemy looking in through the window and describing what he sees in the church. And what does he see? Not a building, not a program, but what does he see? Acts of care and compassion and service and love. And why is he seeing all of this? Another historian, see how they love one another. Is that what they say about us? Is it even possible to say that based on 9.30 to 12.30? I want to hypothesize that it's not possible to say that. Why not? Because there is no time to love one another from 9.30 to 12.30. Because the only thing we can do in those three hours is what? In part, information. It's not possible to really get to know each other. And yet, of the early Christians, they said, see how they love one another. What would they say about us? What should they say about us? And why would they say that about us? All of those things that we spoke about, the care, the service, the love, the compassion, the evangelism, the mission, the outreach, and the intensity of all of those experiences, none of those were forced, none of those were contrived, None of those were out of a sense of duty. None of those were out of a fear of hell or a fear of repercussions or of judgment. All of those were because they had experienced Jesus. You know, the greatest need of Christianity for the Seventh-day Adventist church, just as much, the greatest need for us here in Bendigo, and I don't even know you, but I know that this is common in all of our churches. The greatest need is not more evangelism. 
The greatest need is not caring for each other. The greatest need is not getting together on Sabbath. Oh, after COVID, we've lost some people. They're not coming back. That's not the greatest need. What's the greatest need? The greatest need is experiencing Jesus. And not once in 1973 are experiencing Jesus daily. The greatest need is making the choice to experience winning the lotto every day. And we do that by being in the presence of Jesus. And it's really, really simple. Because my children sing a song about this when we have worship in the evenings. And it's a really simple children's song. And it goes like this. Read. How does it go? Read your Bible. Pray every day. Pray every day. And you'll grow, grow, grow grow. It's not rocket science. You don't have to be a Hebrew or a Greek scholar. You don't have to go to Avondale College to become a pastor. You don't have to look far and wide for a Bible because you've got every translation in every language on your phone for free. If you don't know how to use a phone, talk to Pastor Daniel. He'll give you one for free in any language, any size. He'll give you two for that matter. We've got Pastor Graham Christian here. He can give you one. Everyone can give you a Bible. It doesn't have to be an hour, two, three, five, but at least start. Because there is a peace that passes understanding when you encounter Jesus. And that's his promise. Read a few verses. Spend a little bit of time in prayer. And you know what? You don't have to look at the clock. You don't have to put a timer on. Because if you choose to do that regularly, there'll be a desire to do more of it. And you'll find yourself wanting to do it not just in the morning or not just in the evening, but... When you're driving, put a little bit of time. When you're going for a walk, talk to Jesus. It doesn't have to be fancy. And thankfully, he understands English aside from just the KJV version. You can talk to him however you want, and he'll get it. You don't have to start with an introduction. You don't have to have a finish. You can just start talking mid-sentence. And you know what? It's okay. He gets it. And you don't have to have an elaborate, complex reading plan to get through the Bible in one year. Now, it's wonderful if you do that, but it's not necessary. In fact, you can pick up the Bible and just ask and say, Lord, where do you want me to start and wait for an impression? Otherwise, just open somewhere in the New Testament and just read again. And if you read the same chapter today as you read yesterday, you know what? That's okay. Plans are good. Structure's good. I'm structured. I'm planned. That's how my mind works. But you don't have to do it that way. And why would we even want to do that? Well, I want to encourage you individually and as a church to reflect on this checklist. Do I have overflow? When I wake up in the morning, do I wake up and I say, wow, this world is in my home. And I'm, I'm, I'm okay. And in fact, I'm better than okay because I won the lotto. And it's not a money lotto that the moths and the rust doth corrupt. It's an eternal lotto. And, and today, why am I alive today? Well, I've got to go to work. But in fact, work is just an excuse to do what? What is work an excuse for? Work is God's opportunity for me to share the good news. That's why I go to work. And then when I'm not working or I have some spare time, well, maybe there's a brother or a sister that, that I haven't talked to or that needs some help or that I can get to know or that I can have over for a meal. You don't have to cook fancy meals. I'm going to give you a recipe for fellowship. What you can do that's really easy to have people over all the time on a budget. Sliced bread and Vegemite. Anybody here not like Vegemite? Don't put your hand up because you don't like Vegemite. Oh, I'm going to be careful what I say. Okay, let's go for another one. What about corn chips and salsa? Can we do that? Do you think anybody really cares what food you give them when you invite them over for a meal? Do you think anybody cares? We've got on us man young here. We'll make sure we do some cheese for your salsa as well. People aren't concerned about the food. They want what? Community and fellowship. And so if you're worried about budgets and finance, and if you're worried that your house isn't clean enough, ask the pastor for a spare church to the car park. Just bring a table and do Vegemite and toast in the car park. If we're not doing those sorts of things, if we're not sharing the good news in our workplaces, 
and in our neighborhoods and in our communities, if it doesn't drive us, if we don't wake up and say, I've got overflow, do you know what that means? It's not a trick question. If you don't wake up and you say, I've got overflow, it means you don't have what? You don't have Jesus, you don't have overflow. Is that a pretty simple way of looking at it? If I woke up, if I wake up and I don't want to tell people about Jesus, then I don't have anything to share. And you know what? That's okay. Because when you don't have Jesus, what does he offer? Ask and you will receive. Seek and you will find. It's not rocket science. Just say, I don't have you. I don't have overflow. I'm feeling miserable today. Tensions at home, financial problems, my health isn't great. All the more reason to seek and to search and to ask. Why don't you do that as a mental checklist? Is this your experience in your life? Are you sharing the good news? Are you caring for others? Do you uh, get excited about getting together with other church members? And if not, it's okay. I'm not here to tell you off. I'm not here to judge you. I'm not here to condemn you. Because right after John 3.16, for the Son of Man, for God so loved the world that, you know that one? And what does it say right after that? The Son of Man did not come into the world to, to condemn the world. It's not a condemnation. It's a diagnosis. Can you imagine going to the doctor with a cough and the doctor says, you have a flu, or you have the cold, and you say, how dare you judge me? And have you done that recently to your local GP? I think you've got COVID. <gasps> You're pointing a finger at me. No, it's a diagnosis. That's why you go to the doctor. That's why we have a checklist. It's not a condemnation. Jesus didn't come to condemn. He didn't come to make you feel guilty and feel bad about yourself. You can do that all on your own. You don't need Jesus to make you feel bad. You're very talented at that. So am I. Jesus didn't come to condemn. He came to save the world. And so if you go through this checklist and this isn't part of your day-to-day -day experience or you haven't experienced these, these desires or these activities or these actions for a week or for a month or for a year or for 10 or for 50 since you last got baptized, that's okay. This is a diagnosis. It's simply saying that something's missing. And what's missing? Jesus. And... You can find Jesus in the words of Scripture. You can find Jesus in the promptings of the Holy Spirit, that still small voice in your mind. You can find Jesus as you talk to him. Next time the board meets together, what's your checklist? Your checklist is, what is our experience? And if this isn't your experience, then drop everything else, delete the board meeting agenda, except for the financial things and ad save things because you've got to do those, but delete everything else. And just get together and say, let's read the Bible together. Because you know what? If we don't have this, what good does any of our planning meetings do? Nothing. And if we could get together and we have Sabbath school, and we how many people have done the Sabbath school lesson? Well, don't ask that question. That's embarrassing because most of us haven't. Well, let's just read the Bible and let's just pray. That's what disciples did, and they encountered Jesus. That's what Christians have done for 2,000 years, and they've encountered Jesus. And we can do that. It's not rocket science. It's simple. Next week, what will people see in Bendigo Church? Someone was looking through the back door, what would they witness? What would they witness in your churches, wherever you're from? When you wake up tomorrow morning, the first thing you think of, what are you experiencing? What are you feeling? If your experience isn't one that's encountered Jesus each day, then my prayer, my invitation, and my challenge is read your Bible, pray every day, and you'll grow, grow. Thank you very much. Jesus, with thy church, abide at the turn of the music as usual. Oh, 
Father in heaven, we thank you for the gift of Jesus. We thank you for the hope, the assurance of salvation that we have. Lord, the joy we have of looking forward to your soon return. We thank you, Father, that in Jesus you have given us all things. We thank you that you have promised we can have a joyful and an abundant life. Lord, we know that the temptations and the attacks of the enemy take our eyes off Jesus. Make us look at the storms of life. Lord, we are so easily ensnared by the sins that so easily beset us. Father, I pray that for each one of us, your spirit may accompany us as we depart today. May you remind us tonight, tomorrow, and each subsequent day to experience you, to be connected with you. Lord, prompt us each morning to begin the day with you, to experience you through your word, through prayer, through the promptings of your spirit. Lord, may we yearn and ask and seek for that deeper experience. And Lord, you have promised that if we ask, you will give. And we pray that you fill us with your spirit, that you impart the promise of being with us, to never leave nor forsake us. Lord, may Jesus fill our hearts, and may from that overflow we be a light to the world around us. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen.